Hi there, history fans. So today we're continuing with the Epic History TV series Napoleonic Wars. And today we have the Battle of Salamanca uh, in 1812. Okay, you know the drill. The original video is in the description below. Give them a view and a like. Uh, if you didn't watch the previous videos, there's going to be links above so you can check it out. And um, yeah, as always, I'm going to give my thoughts, opinions and additional information. If you want to correct me, add something, please do it in the comment section below. Okay, let's jump into the video. Whoa. By 1812, Napoleon's French Empire had a quarter of a million troops stationed in Spain, bogged down in a war that seemed to have no end. They faced a bitter struggle against the people of Spain, who'd taken up arms in a guerrilla war, as well as the remnants of Spain's field armies and an Anglo-Portuguese army under Lord Wellington. But French forces in Spain remained... Just a quick recap. So we're now in, 12, uh, uh, in 1812 and we talked about how the French troops already uh, had resistance against them in 1808, where they tried to conquer Portugal, but then Spain rose up and fought together with the Portuguese and the Brits against the French. But yeah, and throughout the whole years from 1808 until, you know, like the end, uh, the guerrilla uh, guerrilla warfare, warfare was a big part uh, at the Peninsula, Peninsula War. Formidable and in firm control of the capital, Madrid, and most major cities. And the year began with another great French victory in the south and a calamity for Spain. This video is sponsored by Audible, our favorite place to go for audiobooks. They have Segway. an unmatched selection of fiction, comedy, classics and original content, all of which you can listen to on the go. On pretty okay, I'm interested in more, not so much in the battle. I'm not going to spoil it, what, what happens uh, at the end of the battle, but I'm more interested in what what's happens surrounding the battle, you know, like uh, what happened with the civilians, because we know that with guerrilla warfare uh, and irregular warfare, the civilian population is actually always in the middle of two and of the two conflicting the armies and, and the bulk the of the you know like damage reprisals and everything goes to the civilian population and we saw uh, examples in the last episode where uh, it was called what like napoleon's vietnam or something like that so yeah I, i'm pretty interested how the spanish and portuguese people reacted to 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 the oh my god i already uh, i almost spoiled it Troops in Spain this war would. Spain and Portugal would become a graveyard, not just for young French conscripts, but for the reputation of some of France's most famous generals. General Junot, Marshal Soult, and Marshal Jourdain had all tasted defeat. Marshal Massena had been recalled in disgrace. Yep. Marshal Louis Gabriel Suchet was the exception. French generals in Spain were notorious for their looting. Soult, based in Andalusia, was probably the worst, reckoned to have stolen one and a half million francs worth of art from Spanish monasteries and churches. As governor of Aragon, and that looting and, and taking away, you know, like art and gold and everything, that didn't happen only in Spain, but it happened throughout Europe. I know uh, stories from the city of Graz in Austria, where, you know, the, like the local people before giving up the, the city gates, they, um, they put everything that, you know, like the big possessions that the city had in a secret place so that the French army wouldn't get it. But it was actually a common thing for the French to do. Marshal Suchet behaved very differently. He enforced strict discipline on his troops, punishing any who tried to steal or extort money from the Spanish, while treating local authorities with respect. He combined this hearts and minds strategy with ruthless military action against the guerrillas, 
that was able to establish firm control of Aragon. Actually a good tactic. In June 1811, after a particularly bloody assault, Suchet took the port of Tarragona, for which Napoleon rewarded him with his Marshal's baton. The Emperor then sent him reinforcements and ordered him to take Valencia. First he routed a much larger Spanish army that attacked him at Saguntum, before he laid siege to Valencia. The city was packed with Spanish troops and refugees, and to avoid starvation, General Blake surrendered Valencia on the 8th of January 1812. The French took 18,000 prisoners, including 23 generals, Whoa. and nearly 500 guns. It was a devastating blow to the Spanish cause. But to reinforce Suchet, Napoleon had stripped troops from other armies in Spain, and then withdrawn 25,000 of the best troops for his imminent invasion of Russia. The result was that French forces in Spain were now severely overstretched, just as Wellington prepared to strike. And don't get it wrong, you know, like you see that uh, this is red, so this is one side, and blue is for the French, and you would, you would think, you know, like, yeah, they're separate, you know, like the French throw, you know, like in the middle, and they're now separate, they cannot coordinate with each other and so on, but all the French territory that you can see here, it's not deep blue, it's, you know, like with red dots, so you always need to take into consideration that there were always guerrilla fightings in, in this place. And yeah, as uh, Napoleon prepared for the invasion of Russia, which will come, I think, in th two or three episodes, so stay tuned, uh, he recalled actually the most experienced and most veteran soldiers actually from Spain to come and join his Grande Armée to invade Russia. Spanish guerrillas kept Wellington well informed of French movements, and learning that the forces facing him in western Spain had been much weakened, he decided to go on the offensive, to strike a blow before the French could concentrate against him. On the day that Valencia fell, he laid siege to Ciudad Rodrigo on the Portuguese-Spanish frontier. Eager to take the city before Marshal Marmont could march to its relief, he ordered an assault after just 10 days. It succeeded, though Major General Crawford of the Light Division was among 300 killed. Wellington then marched south to besiege the much more strongly defended city of Badajoz. assault was made on the night of the 6th of April. The first wave attacking the main breach were slaughtered. But what was supposed to be a diversionary attack on the city's castle with scaling ladders succeeded, and the city soon fell. Oh, nice. The storming of Badajoz cost the British 3,700 casualties. In the aftermath, Survivors went on the rampage, drinking, looting and raping, and killing more than 100 Spanish civilians, before British officers finally restored order. That's bad. Wellington had secured the two main routes between Spain and Portugal. Now he sent his most reliable subordinate, General Hill, with a... So they probably took those two cities, or those two forts, because they are like on the main route to, to, you know, like the coastal lands of Portugal, I would say. Small Anglo-Portuguese force to destroy the bridge over the Tagus at Almaraz. This was a vital link between Marmont's army of Portugal and Soult's army of the south, as the next usable bridge was at Toledo, 90 miles east. The bridge was well guarded by forts and redoubts, but Hill led a swift and daring assault. The French defences were taken by surprise, the bridge itself and all the engineering equipment burned, 
for the cost of just 177 casualties. Wellington was now ready to begin his advance into Spain. Spanish regular forces and guerrilla bands began operations to tie down as many French troops as possible. While from the Bay of Biscay, Sir Hume Popham's naval raiding force made diversionary attacks on French coastal targets. In four days, Wellington was at Salamanca, as Marmont, outnumbered, withdrew behind the Douro River. But when reinforcements arrived, he crossed the river again. There we are. For six days, Marmont tried to march around Wellington's flank, but the British general matched him move for move, their two armies marching in parallel, often within sight of each other. But on the seventh day, Marmont blundered. Let me know if you know this. So we talked already about the uh, con new concepts of the French army and we talked about, you know, like the higher mobility of the French army, but also the Austrian army. But I'm not that familiar with, you know, like the British um, uh, chain of command and how they're structured. So was it also flexible like the French one or was it more rigid? Let me know if you know that. On the morning of the 22nd of July, Wellington's army occupied high ground four miles south of Salamanca. Marmont was not interested in a direct assault. He still sought to outflank Wellington, threaten his line of retreat to Portugal, and force him to fall back. Around 8am, the French won a dash for a hill known as the Greater Arapil, which Marmont made his observation point. The French army began to swing round behind him. Marmont had convinced himself that Wellington was an overly cautious general who would not risk attack. The hills hid most of Wellington's army from view. And when Marmont saw dust clouds to the west, he assumed it was Wellington's baggage train leaving Salamanca, beginning their retreat. But it was the British 3rd Division and a Portuguese cavalry brigade moving up to strengthen Wellington's flank. Bruh. Because he wasn't planning a retreat. He was about to attack. Oof. Around 2pm, Marmont ordered the five infant... Maybe one of the most gruesome time periods, you know, like hand-in-hand -hand combat. I cannot imagine, you know, like myself in those picket lines and just moving while cannons are shooting. And then when you cannot reload that fast, then you need to charge with bayonets. I mean, it's crazy. Three divisions waiting in the woods behind him to march west to cut off Wellington's imagined retreat. General Mokun's 5th Division, in the lead, stopped to engage what was presumed to be the British rearguard in the village of Los Arapiles. General Tomier's 7th Division continued west past it. Wellington watched as the French left flank became increasingly strung out and knew it was an opportunity too good to miss. He galloped three miles across country to the 3rd Division to give the crucial orders in person. Many of his staff officers struggled to keep up. On arrival, he instructed the division's commander, his own brother-in-law, Edward Pakenham, to attack and drive everything before him. The 3rd Division's advance was hidden by low hills until the last minute. Tomier's division was caught completely unawares and shattered by the assault. Tomier's himself was killed, half his division killed or captured, the rest soon put to flight. Ooh. At 
this crucial moment, Marshal Marmont was hit by a British shell, and carried from the field seriously wounded. His second-in-command, General Bonnet, was himself wounded an hour later. So command passed to General Clausel. Forty-five minutes later, the British 5th Division attacked, supported by two Portuguese brigades and General Le Marchand's dragoons. The French saw the cavalry coming and formed square, but were hit first by the British infantry, who unleashed a close-range volley, then charged with the bayonet. The French were routed and charged down by Le Marchand's cavalry. French 6th Division was caught up in the collapse. Le Marchand himself was shot from the saddle, but his brigade had helped destroy eight French battalions and captured eight. two eagles. Whoa. Wellington's echelon attack continued, as Cole's 4th Division advanced in the centre. But Pack's Portuguese brigade was thrown back from the Greater Arapil, and the whole division was soon falling back in disorder. Despite the devastation of his army's left flank, General Clausel decided to launch an attack on the Lesser Arapil, the hinge of Wellington's position. If it could be taken, he might still snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. But the French advance was met by fresh troops of Clinton's 6th Division, who poured volleys of musket fire into the French columns. They began to fall back. The French army had lost the will to fight on, its soldiers streaming away into the woods behind them. General Ferre's 3rd Division mounted a brave rearguard action to buy the rest of the army time to escape, but it faced a hopeless task. It was soon outflanked by the British 5th Division, and Ferre himself was killed. Only General Foy's 1st Division escaped in good order. With darkness falling, and his army exhausted, Wellington called off the pursuit. When you think what is maybe one of the most important things in a battle, it's keeping the morale of your troops and to rout the enemy troops. And if you lose a big symbol of your unit or the troops, like they said, losing two eagles for the French was a big thing. And when you lose two eagles, it, it, it demin demolishes your morale, especially when it starts to spread to the other units that are, you know, like dispersed through, through the whole line. So it was a big thing, losing those two eagles. The savior of Spain. Wellington had smashed Marmont's army, taking 7,000 prisoners and killing or wounding 6,000 more, a French casualty rate of 25%, and more than double Wellington's own losses. Wow. The next day, dragoons of the King's German Legion attacked the French rearguard and achieved the almost unheard of feat yeah. of charging down a French infantry square yeah. and taking another thousand prisoners. Wellington now decided to march on Madrid, forcing King Joseph to abandon the capital and retreat to Valencia to join up with Marshal Suchet. On the 12th of August, Wellington liberated the city to scenes of wild celebration. Soult, now at risk of being cut off in Andalusia, abandoned the siege of Cadiz, which had dragged on for two and a half years, and marched east to join Joseph and Suchet. And taking Madrid was very important because look at the tra uh, I mean the routes here, here, you know, like between Sevilla and and uh, Valencia. Uh, through this part, you didn't almost have any, you know, like big roads that you can use to transfer your units as fast as possible because you had also the heavy cannons and so on. So controlling Ma Madrid was a big, 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 big part in, in, the, in the whole Spanish, uh, uh, you know, like campaign, war, 
whatever you want to call it, because from Madrid you can go everywhere. The following month, Wellington marched north, pushing the French back from Valladolid and besieging the castle of Burgos. But his army lacked heavy guns, and the French garrison fought bravely. As powerful French armies gathered to the north and south, Wellington himself was now in danger of being trapped. He had no choice but to withdraw. Wellington's retreat turned into a desperate, forced march through autumn rain. The supply system collapsed, and many starving soldiers looted what food they could find from Spanish villages. Madrid was abandoned and reoccupied by the French on the 1st of November. Wellington was back where he'd started five months before. But despite the campaign's dismal conclusion, his strike into Spain had led to the liberation of huge swathes of the country, and left the French yeah, more overstretched than ever. Reinforced and resupplied, Wellington would be back the next year to deliver the final blow to Joseph's Spanish kingdom. 1812 had seen the tide of war turn, and not just in Spain. Because 2,000 miles to the east, in Russia, catastrophe had engulfed the Grande Armée. Welcome to Russia. Thank you to all our Patreon supporters Russia. who've made this series <laughs> yeah, possible. Yeah, a big shout out to their Patreon members. Yeah, as I, as I said it like uh, in the last video, why was Spain so important for the um, for uh, for France? Because of like two main reasons. First of all, from Spain you could more or less control, you know, like the Gibraltar Gibraltar area, so the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea. That's the first thing. And the second thing is uh, when, if Spain falls, France is directly, you know, like on the front, the, the, the mainland of France is directly on the front with the allies. So French, the French tactic was always, yeah, we should fight in other lands, you know, like German lands, Prussian lands and so on. Keep the enemy out of our land so our economy can, you know, like function in the backside as normal and our propaganda and so on can function normally you know like the normal people won't get that much from the war but if spain falls there is always the possibility that the brits could you know like uh, uh make an uh, um disembark on the spanish soil and then together with with the spanish uh, people go just into 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 france and then bring the war to france but yeah, as he said, Napoleon had also very big troubles in the East with Russia, but it's going to come in the next episode. So if you don't want to miss new episodes, just hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified when new videos come out. And until next time, see ya.